We're in week three of our Got Me Shook series, and obviously, if you haven't caught on by now, this is a total parody rip off of BuzzFeed, but I thought, because we completely ripped off of their site, why not tribute BuzzFeed in an honorable way by doing a quiz, and, and actually doing a BuzzFeed quiz, and so I, I actually went online, and I was looking at different quizzes, and I, found, I came across this quiz on patients, and uh, it's at 12 or 13 questions, and they have these little slider scales that you can do and use to kind of measure how patient you are. And so I didn't want to go through 12 or 13 things, so that would be kind of annoying. Um, and so I was like, well, let me just pick kind of five of these items off of this list and just kind of gauge as a church, as a community, how patient we are in general. And so uh, I'll kind of um, bring these up. So here's the first one, okay? Cookies, warm cookies coming out of the oven. So here's the question. How many of you, you know, man, cookies come out of the oven, I've got to have them right away? Hands up. Okay, that's nearly everyone. <laughs> Does anyone have discipline? Does anyone have any sort of self-control? Like, you can wait three minutes. Three minutes? Ten minutes? God, what's wrong with you guys? <laughs> I've got to have it right away. Krista gets so upset. She loves to bake. Her and G will bake at least once a week. And, and it's like, the moment it comes out of the oven, I'm like, I've got to go in. I, there, there's no reason to wait. And, and so those of you who wait, what's wrong? Um, <laughs> Okay, so most of us don't have any patience with cookies. How about this one? This is really unique because, okay, it's a free t-shirt, but it's a cool t-shirt, okay? So this is just a generic one, but it's a cool t-shirt that you would want. So how long would you wait for a free t-shirt? Anyone, like, unwilling to wait at all? Okay, nobody, good. Uh, how many of you would wait at least 10 minutes for a free t-shirt that you would like or that you would enjoy? 10 minutes, hands up, okay. Of those, keep your hands up. How many of you who would wait 10 minutes would wait, like, 30 minutes for a free t-shirt? Some, okay. How many of you would wait 60 minutes, an hour, for a free t-shirt? It's a cool t-shirt. Yeah. Wow. An hour for a free t-shirt. I was a part of a church in South Carolina that gave out free t-shirts like every year. And so they would give out free t-shirts, and as they would give out these t-shirts, if they ran out of a shirt, if they ran out of a certain size of a shirt, people would go nuts. And then, no kidding, people would take these shirts and within like minutes have them posted on eBay for sale, and people were going nuts over free t-shirts. I'm like, I just don't get it. I can just buy it. I can just go get a different shirt, even if it's not this one. But for those of you, props to those of you who are willing to wait an hour for a free t-shirt. Okay, here's the next one. Um, this is going to be interesting. This is going to reveal a lot about the room. Meeting your favorite celebrity. Okay, here we go. Here are the options. Let's just go an hour. How many of you would wait an hour to meet your favorite celebrity? Wow, look around the room. Look around the room. Keep those hands. I see that hand. Uh, let's keep them raised, okay? How many of you would wait two hours to meet your favorite celebrity? Wowzers. How many of you wait four hours to meet your favorite celebrity? How many of you would wait eight hours? Wow. Wow. This is crazy. Yeah, okay, you put your hands down. That's absurd to me. <laughs> Nick Jonas, okay. Um, I, I have zero tolerance for it. Yeah, so I found, found, who's like me, okay? This, I'm, I'm dead serious. I would wait no more than 15 seconds to meet my favorite celebrity. No more than 15 seconds. Anyone like me? Here, here's why. Here, here's why. What am I going to do? Hey, nice to meet you. Take a picture and that's it? Who cares? Why would I do that? If I, now if you're saying you get to hang out with them for a day or, or whatever, or have a conversation, that's a whole different story. But to just meet them and say, I like you, and, and, and it's like, for what? I'm not interested. I have more integrity and dignity and belief in myself than that. And so I'm just unwilling to do it. Okay, all right, here's, but I don't judge anyone who is. Um, here's, here's the next one. Okay, a uh, $100 bill. How many of you would wait for, a, for no strings attached, you just, someone's just giving out free $100 bills. How long would you wait, 30 minutes? Anyone willing to wait 30 minutes? Okay, anybody willing to wait 60 minutes? Okay, anybody willing to wait two hours, 120 minutes for $100? Uh, not me. Okay, some of you, good, that's fair. I, I just figure like two hours into this thing, there's plenty of stuff in my apartment I could have sold on eBay to make the $100. So I just, I rationalize it and I'm just like, I'm, you know, but an hour, I'll wait an hour. I can scroll through Instagram and line and figure my life out while I wait for 100 bucks. Okay, here's the, here's the last one I'll share with you guys. Um, so your friend is running late. This is, this is the true test of character. Your friend is running late. How long before you get annoyed? 15 minutes? 30 minutes? 60 minutes before you're finally annoyed. Wow. Wow. 
okay, this is when I realized at this point in the quiz is when I realized that I'm actually not that spiritual. Um, because legit, 15 minutes into it, I get annoyed. And like really annoyed. But here's why I'm not spiritual. Not that I get annoyed, but that I pretend that I'm not annoyed. And so I lie to make that person feel better about them. So it's like, oh, I'm really, I'm, oh, no worries, man. I just got here too. And I'm like, no, I'm angry. Like I'm upset. I did not just get here. I got here 20 minutes ago. And, and, and so I went through this whole quiz, right? They got like 12, 13 questions. And uh, so I was like, I wonder where, like, I thought I was pretty good, but this is my actual screenshot of my results. <laughs> you got not patient at all. You're not a patient person. That's okay. Your time is precious, and you make sure you're not wasting it. Waiting around is time you, can, you can't get back, and before you know it, we'll all be dead. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. That sums up my life. <laughs> That sums up my perspective. And, and, and the fact is, is, I was kind of going through this quiz, and I thought, you know, we're not really patient. Me, I'm not really patient. Most of us maybe are a little bit more patient than we realize. But I, by nature, am not a patient person. In fact, this is a true story. Last week, um, Stephen can vouch for this. So we have these little thermostats around the room. And every week, you know, I go and I set, I adjust the thermostat and, you know, set the AC or whatever. And I was, like, explaining to, I think it was Stephen and Caroline a couple weeks ago. I was like, okay, so to change this, you just have to keep pressing this button until it finally like switches over. And, and so I was like, I don't know why, but you just got to keep pressing the button. And then finally it works. So last week, I went in there to turn the, to adjust the setting or whatever, and I touched it once, and then for whatever reason didn't press it again, but it, literally like in half a second, it turned on. And so what it was, was that I was pressing the button too fast, too quick, and it was like stalling the system. It was messing it up, and it couldn't work because I was so impatient. I'm like, why is this thing not clicking? But I kid you not, it was about a half second. That's all I had to wait in order for the AC to kick on. Instead, I'm over here tapping it like a caveman, waiting for this thing to turn on, and nothing is changing because I'm so impatient, and I don't have this ability to just wait for something. But I don't know, maybe I'm preaching to myself today, but am I the only one that can relate to this? Am I the only one that struggles with patience? Am I the only one that gets frustrated when things don't happen in the time that I've allotted or the time that I've planned or the time that I envision? Has anyone else experienced that where you just feel like, man, this is a struggle because I thought by this point this would happen, or I thought at this point in the game I would be at this point in my career, or I thought at this point in this person's life they would be at this point in their faith, and we just struggle with patience. Can anyone else relate at all? Okay. Thank you. Uh, good, because that means today's message is going to apply to us all and not just me. So I'm grateful for that. And we're going to continue with the story actually found in Mark 8. But I want to uh, kind of set it up this way. And I want to give you, if you, I'm going to preach a message that I'm going to call, See What They Can't. See What They Can't. S-E-E, What They Can't. I won't spell out the rest because I figure you can figure that part out yourself. Um, but Mark chapter 8 is where we're going to pick up. And this is um, you know, Mark of, of, of the four gospel writers, Mark's account is the shortest. He's, he was the most manly because he put the least details. And, and so he was a standard male operative. Let me just write shorthand. Basically, here's what happened. Here's all you know. He could tell a story that Luke would write in like 25 verses. Mark would tell it in two. And so Mark is my kind of guy. He's, you know, my kind of man. You know, just give me the facts. Move on. My time is precious. I don't have a whole lot of time to wait. So we're going to read just five verses today, but here's what Mark writes in chapter 8, verse 22. He says this, When they arrived at Bethsaida, some people brought a blind man to Jesus, and they begged him to touch the man and to heal him. Jesus took the blind man by the hand and led him out of the village. Then spitting on the man's eyes, he laid his hands on him and asked, Can you see anything now? The man looked around. Yes, he said. I can see people, but I can't see them very clearly. They look like trees walking around. Verse 25. Then Jesus placed his hands on the man's eyes again, and his eyes were opened. His sight was completely restored, and he could see everything clearly. And Jesus sent him away, saying, don't go back into the village on your way home. You know, when I think about this whole kind of series that we've been in, and I think about the, the nature of what we're talking about in terms of seeing people's lives change, seeing people go from, from darkness to light, seeing people go from you know, blindness to sight, seeing people go from you know, apart from Jesus or apart from God and walking in fellowship with God, one of the things that I realized is that, man, it can be a struggle to actually journey the distance with someone in that situation because of our impatience, because of how frustrated we get. You know, we're, I, I say this a lot, but we're a microwave society. You know, we're the only people in the history of the world who will throw something in a microwave, press a button, and expect that in 60 seconds our meal is fully prepared. In fact, we're not even, we're so impatient, we can't even press six, zero, enter. We just need one button to do it. 
We just want one button that can do it. So it's not just our impatience, but our laziness as well. And so we just don't want to wait for anything. We'll leave something in a microwave, and then we're going to walk away from it because we've got other things to do, because we've got something else that we could get done in the 60 seconds that it takes to heat up that food or that coffee or whatever it is that you've put in the microwave. Think about it another way. Think about the last time you went to uh, a fast service, not like a fast food restaurant, but a fast service restaurant. It could be fast food, McDonald's, Chipotle, or you know, something like that, Chick-fil-A, whatever. And think about the last time you went and you had to wait for something more than five minutes, four minutes, more than 300 seconds, and how frustrated and aggravated you got, how many times you kept checking your phone or checking your watch, wondering, what's taking so long for them to cook an entire meal? What's taking so long for them to bring out the barbacoa because I'm waiting for this thing to come so I can fill my burrito and eat? And then you just get so aggravated by how long something takes, even though what we realize is that that length of time actually isn't very long. But in the little things, it creates impatience and it creates frustration with us. And that's also true. And the big thing, and when I talk about myself, I think about, okay, if I get frustrated in that, In that context, in that situation where I've got to wait for something like food, then how much more so do I get frustrated in my line of work where the goal, the objective of what I do isn't to preach a message, is not to build a a congregation of hundreds and thousands of people, but it's to see life change. The objective of, of of, of why I do what I do, why I invest what I do, why I give what I do, why I sacrifice what I do, is so that I can see transformation and change take place in someone else's life, in your life, in someone we don't know yet's life. And that's why I do what I do, yet I realize that I can't control the speed or the rate or the pace at which that happens. And so I find myself getting frustrated. You know, because I expect, you know, if this person is here, then they should be here by the X amount of time or by X amount of investment or by X amount of commitment or by X amount of prayers. And I find myself getting discouraged and frustrated when that just doesn't happen or when I see things like that that aren't taking place. And what I've had to learn or what I've had to realize is that though that no two people are the same, which I think we know in theory, but we don't always apply in our hearts. No two people are the same, and so regardless of the fact that maybe their journeys are similar, that's no indication that their futures are going to be the same either. Just because it's taken someone this path, and just because I've seen other people go through this path, doesn't mean that where they're headed is going to look like where other people are headed. And just because I expect that if I do this and this and this, that it should produce this, doesn't guarantee that that's going to be the case. Doesn't guarantee that that's going to be the way Jesus is going to work, or that Jesus is going to operate. I can't reduce a person's transformation or their salvation to some simple formula or a cute acrostic on a message. I can't reduce their transformation into, okay, well, if you just go to church, if you give, if you serve, then that should produce life change because it doesn't. That's not the way it works. I wish it was because it would make my job a lot easier and it would make me feel a lot better about myself if I'm honest. But that's not the way God works. And that's not what Jesus is after. And, 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 and the people that I care about, the people that I've prayed for, and the, those that I've longed for for years where I'm thinking, man, God, if you would just flip the switch, God, if you just, it just gets aggravating because sometimes it seems like they take one step toward Jesus and then 10 or 15 backpedals away from Jesus. And there have been times where it seems like someone is just kind of on the brink of connecting with Jesus, but then all of a sudden, for whatever reason, just kind of step away. And it feels like, man, we were so close. We were right on the cusp of this. We were right on the edge of this. And, and, and what I would venture to say is that there are probably some people that you've prayed for, probably some people that you've been connected to, probably some people that you've been invested in who have done the same thing and it's left you feel, feeling confused or befuddled or wondering, what is Jesus doing? Because I thought that the change was going to happen. I thought the transformation, yeah, Ricky, I hear you saying got me shook, but I'm trying to get shook and it ain't happening. I want to be shook, but nobody's changing. I want to be transformed by someone else's transformation, but it's just not happening in the way that I was hoping. It's discouraging. It's frustrating. It's disappointing. It's all those things. And and I know that some of you feel this way because I see the prayer request every single week. I see the connection cards. I see the names of people that many of you are writing for and praying over every single week asking for salvation. I think of the the prayer night that we had just a couple weeks ago where we listed out some 20-something names of people that were believing salvation and transformation over. And I know the burden. I heard the burden on your hearts as you spoke them out loud. 
I looked over those names this morning and just reminded myself that people care desperately to see someone in their life change Jesus. And we're praying for this. We're believing for this. Yet we find ourselves feeling disappointed because it's not happening at the rate or the speed or in the time that we expected or that we envisioned or that we would taught would happen. You know, I, I think one of the things that's maybe kind of, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Like misnomer maybe that is, is so prevalent in, in the Western church is that, well, if you just bring your friend to church, that'll be the answer. And then you bring your friend to church and like, yeah, that was cool. What are we doing for lunch? And you're like, wait, 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 well, like, you, you didn't raise your hand. Did you, did, you, did you pray? No, what's that? And you just get frustrated because you're like, I thought I did what I was supposed to do. I got them to church and they didn't get saved and they didn't get changed or they didn't get transformed. But God's not interested in, did you get them to something? He's, did you get them to me? Yeah. Or did they come to me? Because I'm the one that changes. I'm the one that saves. I'm the one that transforms. And if you've ever wrestled with that tension, if you've ever felt that discouragement, if you've ever felt the letdown or the disappointment of, man, I've been at this for so long and I don't see any progress yet, then I've got good news because Mark 8 is going to speak to that very situation. And Mark 8, out of this story, I think even though Mark was a man short on words, the implications of this story and this narrative are significant for how we live. And so I want to kind of do similar to how I did last week, and I'm just going to kind of go back to the scriptures and just kind of use them as, a, as kind of a talking point, and then I'll share some stuff at the end. But we're going to go back to verse 22. And, and this is how Mark kind of um, tells the story. He says, when they arrived at Bethsaida, some people brought a blind man to, Je- to Jesus, and they begged him to touch the man and heal him. Have you ever begged God for something? God, if I could just get this job, if I could just get this pay raise, if I could just get this increase, if I could just get that guy, if I could just get that girl, I'll give you everything. Like you start, it's not just begging, you start bartering. And, you know, I'll trade you, what do I got? Uh, I'll trade you whatever it is, like pulling lint out of your pockets and, and hoping that maybe God will move in response to what you're doing. And so they're begging Jesus, heal this guy. Heal him. We're bringing him to you. We're begging you. We're pleading with you to do this. And some of you have done the same thing. God, I'm begging you to change my brother. I'm begging you to save my dad. I'm begging you to transform my spouse. I'm begging you. I'm pleading with you, God, to to do something significant. God, I'll trade anything if it means this one person I know can come to know you. God, I'll give everything. I'll go wherever you send me except for a couple places, but almost everywhere you you want to send me, I'll give it all. (laughs) I've done that. I'm not going to be ashamed of that. I'll go everywhere except for like the Midwest. Um, But, you know, this is where I want to be. And so God, if you can transform them and allow me to be here, then that'll be great. It's the best of both worlds. And so they begged Jesus, Jesus, will you heal them? Will you give them sight? Will you do the impossible? Will you do what, what I feel like is, is not even close to this? And, 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 and the thing is, you know, if you, like, when I look at what we're praying for, when I look at what we're talking about, the truth is that we have a church full of people who are begging Jesus to move in the lives of their loved ones. You're begging Jesus to move in your family's life. You're begging Jesus to heal someone that's hurting. You're begging Jesus to, to give sight to someone who just can't seem to see it. And and so you're bringing them before and you're saying, God, do what you can do. God, do what only you can do because I can't do this. Only you can. And so I'm begging you to move on my behalf. And that's what these friends did. And then it goes on. He writes in verse 23, Jesus took the blind man by the hand and led him out of the village. Then spitting on the man's eyes, he laid his hands on him and asked, can you see anything now? Okay, this verse is loaded. Does anyone know why he spit on his eyes? Okay, me neither. I was hoping someone had an answer. Because <laughs> I genuinely don't know. And, and, and the truth is, if you research it, there's really no answer. People speculate, and there's like, maybe he had a lot of gunk in his eyes, and so it was like a thing to clean out. I'm like, but surely there had to be like a creek or a well or something better than saliva <laughs> to get the gunk out. You know, people said it was a metaphor for a religious significant thing. There's really no answer. So uh, rather than get caught up in this and confuse ourselves, I'm not even going to try to pretend because sometimes some pastor will pretend and they'll say, oh, this is what happened. And that ain't me. Um, So I'm just going to focus on this first part of the verse. He took the blind man by the hand and led him out of the village. This is important because this wasn't just any village. This was Bethsaida. Now, Bethsaida, you may not know, but Bethsaida is repping with some things. 
Bethsaida has a reputation that precedes it. Bethsaida has a place of kind of recognition for a couple of reasons, but none more significant than what Jesus actually said about them in Matthew chapter 11. Look at this, verse 21. Jesus speaking, he says, What sorrow awaits you, Chorazin and Bethsaida? What sorrow awaits you? For if the miracles I did in you had been done in wicked Tyre and Sidon, their people would have repented of their sins long ago, clothing themselves in burlap and throwing ashes on their heads to show their remorse. So Bethsaida was a place that was known where Jesus had gone to and had performed miracles, and he had, re- he had demonstrated himself, he had revealed himself, but they were unwilling to receive what Jesus had done. It was a place that although Jesus had demonstrated his ability, they were unwilling to accept his sovereignty, or his lordship. They had an unrepentant tone to them, an unwillingness to embrace that, yeah, we know what you can do. We're just not that interested in what you can do. And so when Mark writes and he says that Jesus had to go and he he grabbed this guy by the hand and he led him out of this place, what Jesus was doing was saying, this place has rejected my miracles, but you want to respond to my miracles, so I'm going to lead you out of the place of unresponsiveness. I'm going to take you by the hand and I'm going to move you away from a place that's going to block the miracle. And, and I think one of the things that, you know, happens is that we get so accustomed to things being the way they are that we can't see or we don't see or we won't see the way they could be. We get so accustomed to where we're at. We get so accustomed to our own Bethsaidas. We get so accustomed to this circumstance that's blocking the miracle. And Jesus is actually leading this man away from the miracle. Could it be that the person you're praying for, the person that you've been burdened for, the person that you're lifting up, your brother, your dad, your family member, your coworker, your friend, could it be that they're trapped in their own personal Bethsaida, their place of unbelief, their place of unresponsiveness? And while we get frustrated that life change is not taking place, Jesus, out of his grace and his compassion is gently and kindly leading them out of Bethsaida to a place where they can respond. We're frustrated because they brought him in Bethsaida. Jesus, you're here in Bethsaida. Do the miracle now. Have it happen here. Have it happen in this place. But Jesus had the awareness to recognize he won't receive it in this place. And so as a loving Savior, as a kind God, I'm going to lead him out of this circumstance. I'm going to lead him out of the situation and move him into a place where he can actually respond to what I want to do in his life. And I think if we could just kind of grab hold of that for a moment, if we could just take that vision and see that although it's not happening in our time, that although it's not happening in our circumstance, or it's not happening in the way that we envisioned or that the way that we had wanted, that Jesus is doing something bigger than what that person can see and oftentimes bigger than what we can see. That Bethsaida is a place of entrapment, and Jesus isn't about entrapment. He's about freedom. And so he's not concerned about that place. He's concerned about, let me get them to a place where they can respond. Let me get them to a place where I can work. Let me get them to a place where there's no distraction. So he led him out of the town. Mark continues on, and he writes in uh, verses 24 um, and 25. He says this, Uh, Actually, excuse me, I'm going to go back to 23. And um, the end of 23, he says this, can you see anything now? Right? So he spits on his eyes. He asked him, can he see anything? And then the man looked around and he said, yes, I see people, but I can't see them very clearly. They look like trees walking around. Then Jesus placed his hands, verse 25, on the man's eyes again, and his eyes were opened. His sight was completely restored, and he could see everything clearly. So despite the fact Of all of Jesus' miracles, I guess I should say this first, but of all of Jesus' miracles, this is only one of two that have some sort of kind of delay or progression. And and nearly every miracle that is recorded that Jesus performed, the miracle happened instantaneously. It happened within a moment's notice. There was no progression. There was no delay. There was no kind of, um, you know, stalling out or, or waiting for something to happen. Yet in this man's case, Jesus spits on his eyes. He touched and says, can you see? Now, if I'm the blind man, I get kind of upset, like, what, you spit on me and I still can't see? <laughs> like, don't tell me you're going to do this again. It didn't work the first time. And so he touches them and he heals them again. And, and, and despite the fact that Jesus healed them, despite the fact that Jesus touched them, despite the fact that Jesus even spit on his eyes, he still wasn't healed. And I think one of the things that would have been easy if you, if you were the friends, if you were the guys in this situation, to, to experience just kind of the disappointment in that, to let that weight, the weight of that moment sink in on you. 
because you brought your friend to Jesus. You begged Jesus to heal him, which I don't know what it takes for you to beg for something, but these men begged for Jesus to heal him. They got to a place of desperation where there was no other alternative, there was no other option, there was no other choice, and they needed Jesus to move, and so they asked him to move, and yet when Jesus moved, he didn't just say, okay, be healed. He didn't just touch him and his eyes were healed. He brought him out of a town, he spit on him, he touched his eyes, and the guy still couldn't see. And the guy still didn't have the vision that they knew Jesus was capable of offering. And I think what, what happens is that we, in time, or in, 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 in kind of in turn, we get frustrated because someone seems to connect with Jesus, but they won't commit to Jesus. They'll come to church, they'll show up, they'll offer to help, they'll do all these different things, and they'll, you know, even live a morally good life relative to someone else. And it's like they're so close, but they're not there yet for whatever reason. And then we get frustrated. We get upset. We say, Jesus, what's the deal, man, that he's right there? She's right there. I know you can do this, but what's the hang up? What's the hold up? But notice, Jesus never condemned the man. Jesus never rebuked them. To Peter, who was walking on water and started to sink, he said, why did you doubt me? Why do you have so little faith? To this blind man who couldn't see fully after Jesus' touch, he didn't question him. He didn't chastise him. He didn't tell him, you're an idiot. What's wrong with you? Your eyes are really broken. I need you to see. I said see, and you didn't see. You're messing up my record. You're messing up my percentages. It's not looking good for my reputation if you don't see when I said you should see. He didn't do any of that. Instead, he just spoke again. Instead, he, he, he demonstrated and exhibited patience and showed kindness once again and, and, and chose to extend a loving, touching hand to this man so that his sight could be returned, so that his sight could be made whole. And, and, and I think, you know, what we have to remember as the people who are concerned about someone else getting connected to Jesus, about someone else experiencing the transformative power of Jesus, the thing that we have to remember is that Jesus isn't operating on our timetable, nor is Jesus in a rush or a hurry. He's not concerned about the fact, well, if it doesn't happen now, it can't happen then. And while we look at it as things, yes, this is temporal. Yes, eternity is forever. Yes, we don't know if we're giving another breath or we're given another moment. And there's some urgency in that. And that's a healthy thing or can be a healthy, a healthy thing. It can become an unhealthy thing when we're demanding that God operate on our schedule. Because that's not how God operates. That's not how God works. In fact, Peter would later go on to write and he would say this, that God is not slow concerning his promise as some might think. But instead, he is showing patience for your sake. If you want a reference, it's 2 Peter 3, 9. But he says, God is not slow concerning his promise, as some might think. Instead, he is showing patience to those of us who are waiting and those of us who have not yet experienced the transformative power of Jesus. But I want to take a moment and I want to shift the focus just a little bit off of kind of these people that, that, that we're praying for, these people that we're connected to. Now, I kind of want to redirect and pivot it to, to you. And I don't know who you is specifically. But as I was preparing for this message, literally on Tuesday afternoon, as I was working through this message, as I was writing kind of out what God wanted me to say, the Holy Spirit just dropped the word. He said, look, you've got to share something for someone in this room. And you've got to speak into someone. And you've got to give a personal word for someone because there's someone here who feels internally, they're not the friends bringing the blind man. They are the blind man. And they're thinking to themselves, I thought I would have been healed by now. I I thought I would have been over that hurt right now. I thought I would have come overcome that relationship. I thought I would have been in a better situation. I thought that things would be different now, Jesus. I came to you. I gave you everything. I tried this. I prayed this. I did this. I surrendered that. And yet nothing has changed or nothing has been different. And I'm still exactly where I was. I'm still broken. I'm still physically ailing. I'm still relationally sour or hurt. And God, I don't know what to do. I thought by now that something would be different. You thought... That when you committed to Jesus, things would be better by now. You thought that when you got out of that toxic relationship, that you would have some sort of fulfillment or peace or enjoyment or at least someone else to kind of journey through life with because you said, God, I don't need that, so you have something better for me, but the something better hasn't shown up yet. 
You thought that when you went through that surgery, when you went through that medical scare, when you went through that issue, that you would be on the other side of it by now, that you would have the healing that you were experiencing or the healing you were hopeful for, the healing the doctors promised you of, and it's not yet arrived. And you're like, God, where are you? What's taking you so long? What's the issue? What's the struggle? Why why is it that everything else around me is changing except for me? except for my circumstance and my situation. And the thing the Holy Spirit told me to speak is this. He said, listen, like Peter said, I'm not slow concerning my promise over them. I am coming. I'm not slow concerning my promise. They may feel like I've forgotten them, but I didn't forget them. They may feel like they're unworthy of my love, but they're completely worthy of my love. They may feel like they've been rejected by me, but I'm embracing them and I'm bringing them in. They may feel like I've neglected them. They may feel like I've pushed them away. But the fact of the matter is I'm leading them out of Bethsaida to a place where the healing can occur, where the provision can come, where the hope can be found, where the love can be fulfilled, where the thing that you need, the thing that you're so desperately in search of is going to be waiting for you because God has prepared it in advance and designated that you have to move from this place to get to this place. And I'm going to lead you there so that you can experience everything I have for you. And he told me to tell you it's coming soon. So don't give up. Don't be discouraged. Don't wander away. And I don't know who it's for, but I just feel like this weight of that you're just kind of on the brink of saying, God, I'm, I'm done. I'm going to throw in the towel. I'm going to lower my standard. I'm, gonna, I'm just going to look for something else. I'm just going to search for something else. And he's here to tell you that he's here. He's coming. He's right there on the precipice of it. And so don't give up just yet. Because your breakthrough is ready. And it's waiting for you. So stick it out. Stay the course. Keep the standard. Whatever it is and whoever it's for, do what you know you're supposed to do and watch God do what he's supposed to do. Mark, he's in this moment. He's experiencing this. And he sees the situation, the desperation of this blind man. And the celebration occurs when he's healed. He sees his sight was completely restored and he could see everything clearly. But Mark kind of leaves this little caveat, even though he's a man of few words, he kind of shares just this one significant statement that Jesus offers in kind of closing this situation. It says Jesus, um, after he healed him, he says, and the man could see everything, Jesus sent him away saying, don't go back into the village on your way home. Don't go back into the village on your way home. And for me, there's three things that that stand out from this. There's kind of three things that I want you to think. First, Jesus doesn't change people so they can go back to who they were. Don't go back to that place. Don't go back to that addiction. Don't go back to that relationship. Don't go back to that place of hurt. Don't Don't let yourself wander there emotionally. It might be a physical ailment, but don't let yourself wander back to that place of vulnerability emotionally. Jesus didn't change you. Jesus isn't willing to change your friend or your family member or your brother or your sister or your dad or that person that you care about. He's not willing to change them so they could just return back to the place where they were. So don't go back there. He doesn't change us so that we can return. Secondly, this wasn't the man's home. Like if you go back to verse 26 real quick. Here's, here's what Jesus says. He says, he sent him away. Don't go back into the village on your way home. Bethsaida is not where he lived. Bethsaida is just where he was. That person you're praying for, that person you care about, that place where they're at is not where they're from and it's not where they're going. It's just where they currently are in the moment. It's just where they're at. And so don't be discouraged of, man, I just can't, they're so hard-hearted or they're so anti-God or they're so anti-Jesus or they're so anti-faith or they're so anti the conversation or the thought of this. And so I just don't know what to do, but that's not where they're from and that's not where they're headed. It just is where they are. This wasn't his home, nor was it the place where he was going to. And thirdly, just because the man could see doesn't mean he knew how to get home. You think about that? Hey, you're healed. You have sight. Now go home. Okay, where's home? I've never seen it before. I've never, I've been there before, but I've never traveled there with sight. I've always had someone helping me. And this is where the friends come in. And this is where this is important because look, the people you're praying for, when that life change comes, when the salvation comes, when the transformation is experienced, those people, they may have that moment. They may have that divine intervention, but they're going to need some help figuring this thing out. 
because they can't see it. They've not seen it. They've not been there. And and this is where we, as the people who care, we as the people who know, we as the people who follow Jesus can speak into someone's life and say, hey, yeah, you might have just got your sight or you might just see this thing for the first time. This revelation of Jesus has become clear to you, which is great, but you still don't know the course. And so I'm just going to journey with you. I'm going to help you get there. I'm going to walk the path. And, 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 and I'll give you kind of, if you want to sum this up, I'll give you those three thoughts. It's simply this. You've got, when, when you as a friend care enough about what's happening, when I talk about seeing what they can't, what you've got to see is what Jesus could do. Because they can't see it for themselves. You've got to see who they could be. This man was forever designated to be a blind man until Jesus showed up. And then he was given his whole sight. And you've got to see where they could go. He wasn't supposed to go back to Bethsaida. He had a home. Your friend isn't supposed to go back to that place. They have a home. Your cousin, your dad, your brother, they're not supposed to go back to that place. They have a home found in the arms of the Savior. And so you've got to see this when they can't. When they're unable, when the walls are too high, when the blocks are too thick, when you, when you feel like, man, there's no way, you've got to see what they can't. And you've got to see all the potential wrapped up in what Jesus can do. And when you take hold of this vision, it changes the game. And I, I thought, you know, similar to how I've done the past couple of weeks, but I thought to kind of put this together, I'd share uh, the, the story uh, or a story of, of a friend of mine and uh, my friend Dominique. And he lives now in Charlotte. Um, this is Dominique, his wife Shay or Sharon, uh, and their daughter Hannah. And Dominique and I met, I think, three years ago. And we met on a Sunday at church. But it was the type of Sunday at church where the Holy Spirit was moving. People were responding to the message. Literally scores of people experiencing salvation and responding to, to the movement of the Holy Spirit to change and to experience transformation. And so it was just kind of this crazy thing where literally the, the response or the altar was just packed with people. And so I realized like I just it was kind of like, hey, we just got to jump in and help out wherever. And so I got connected with Dominique. He was one of the guys that, that came out the back of the auditorium, and I just connected with him. We started talking, find out like same age, similar situation. His daughter's about a year and a half younger than mine. And so Dominique and I sit down and talk, and I'm like, what's up, man? Like, what, what's going on? And he, and he starts kind of sharing his story. And he's, you know, I grew up in church. My grandma took me to church. It was like part of this crazy thing back in the day called the holiness movement. Uh, and if you don't know what that is, just Google it. You'll be surprised. Um, but, but this whole thing of the holiness movement, which is basically ultra strict and ultra spiritual. But when he got to 15, his grandma told him, look, it's up to you now. I can't force this on you. I can't make this yours. So you have to decide if this is for you. So like most 15-year-old boys, like, it ain't for me. And so he decided to walk away from it and kind of explore and do his own thing and, and have fun in high school and have fun in, in, as he graduated from high school and into becoming a young man. About that time, he, you know, 19, 20 years old, whatever, he met um, Shay and and she was kind of trying to figure out faith and decided she was going to give the Jesus thing a spin and go to church and, and invited him to go. And he's like, any other guy? Yeah, if a girl's invited me to church, I like the girl. I'll go to church. Why not? It's going to be a, I mean, it can't be that bad I just, as long as I don't get no money, as long as they don't tell me to change my life. So he did it. He's like, I'm just going to go. They started going for a little bit. Shay decides she wants to give her life to Jesus and tells him they're sitting next to each other and responds, says, I want to give my life to Jesus. And so I'm going to go forward. Dominique's like, I'll do it too. And so he just like kind of followed her down the line. So they both got saved. But she really got saved and he just kind of fakely got saved. And just decided, you know, this is what I'm going to do to keep this. They would go on, they would date for a while, they would get married, they would have a daughter. And that Sunday that he came out of that room and he sat down across from me, he said, look, I've been playing the Jesus bit for 10 years. I've been going to church. I've been giving. I've told people that I've been saved. I've been volunteering. He's helped out at different camps. He's done all this different stuff. And he's like, but I've never really given my life to Jesus. And I was like, well, I mean, that's great. We can figure that out today. And I was like, does your, your wife know? He's like, no, she doesn't know. I was like, does she know that you're back here responding to the message? He said, no, I told her I was going to the bathroom. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> Father, help me with the words to say. <laughs> I was like, all right. 
bro, I don't know what this means, but we got to do one of these first. <laughs> and, um, and then we got to figure out, let's, let's deal with your issue, and then you got to talk to your wife. And I don't know what she's going to respond or how she's going to respond, because this should be a good thing, but it's kind of covered in something that's not so good. And, and so we'll just figure that out when we get there. But right now, let's figure this out. He's like, he's like yeah, I want to I give my life to Jesus, and I want to surrender to Jesus right, you know, right now. And so he's like, what do I do? I'm like, it sounds like you just did it. You just gave your life to Jesus. You, you know the story. You know the details. You, know, you, just, you just had to be honest about the condition of your heart and where you were at. And so as we're talking, literally, I, I kid you not, the Holy Spirit just dropped this word to me. He said, Ricky, you need to be the guy that leads him. You need to walk this journey with him. You need to be the friend. You need to be the person that guides him and, and kind of steps forward with him. So I'm thinking, okay, I'm going to do that. I got to figure out a way to bring this up. I promise you. Within three minutes of the Holy Spirit giving me that word, he says, he looks at me dead in the eye, he says, so I don't know, is there some sort of ministry here in the church where men can disciple men or something? I'm like, I'm your guy. I got you. <laughs> me and you, bro, we're in. We're in. Like, I got this in. And so, so I just started kind of journeying with him. He goes on, he tells his wife she was obviously upset, but happy and conflicted. And so they got to sort through some things. And so we just kind of start the journey. We're hanging out. We're, we're, we're meeting up to talk. We're going, you know, we're hooping, playing basketball. We're going to McDonald's on National French Friday and, 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 you know, doing all that kind of stuff. And like, so we're just hanging out. Well, then he had a situation happen at his job where he did some things, probably not the best things, um, but it ended up leading, him, leading to him being laid off or, or fired or let go. I don't know which one of the three, probably a combination of all of them. And, and so I'm just kind of journeying with him as he's figuring out this following Jesus thing. And, and so He's looking for a job in the Charlotte area, and so he calls me. He's like, hey, I'm coming up here. I'm like, well, I'll ride with you. We'll go up, and, you know, he's got this job offer, and then we'll go look for places to live or whatever. So we're going, looking at apartments. He's interviewing for this job, and and on the drive up to Charlotte, he tells me, he says, look, man, I never told you all this, but this is everything that's happened, and this is part of the reason why I was let go. And he did some wrong things. It wasn't just like he was a bad employee. He did some things that were involved discretion that were wrong and, 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 and violated trust on multiple levels. And it led to his termination, and it also led to creating a wedge between him and his wife. And so again, I was like, lesson learned from the first time. Yo, have you talked to Shay about this? He's like, yeah, yeah, this time I did. Oh, thank God. <laughs> it worked. Um, and, and so, you know, he's like, but, but here's, here's the deal. I, I, I just, I, I knew I needed to talk to you man to man, and I knew, you know, I needed to talk to my wife and figure this stuff out. But, but here's, here's the crazy thing. Here's why I say, say all this. Because when God spoke to me about journeying with Dominique, one of the things that God was speaking is that, Ricky, he's a lot like you, but you wouldn't be where you are if someone didn't see what you couldn't see. Yeah. And, and he needs someone to see what he can't, to see what he doesn't, to, to see what could be, to see where he could go, to see what I've done for him and to see where I want to take him next. And so we've journeyed and now him and his family are doing great. They're living in Charlotte, their daughter. He sent me a video like a month ago of his daughter preaching about how Jesus doesn't bless bullies. And, and so like, <laughs> it, it was like the sweetest thing. He's like, yo, my daughter's looking for a youth pastor job, bro. He's in, uh, and so, it, but it's incredible to see they're plugged in with a great church in Charlotte. And, and it's just incredible to see the transformation in Dominique's life to see what God is doing, to see that, that God took someone who was in this place of shame and regret and vulnerability and inauthentic, inauthenticity and moved them to a life-giving relationship that's transforming him, is transforming his family, and is doing more than he ever thought imaginable. But that's what happens when you see what they can't. That's what can happen when you see what they can't. And, and I know that in your life, there's probably people or situations or circumstances like, man, they just don't see it. They just don't get it. And for every one of those, I know there's a church community here that does. There's a church community here who does see it, who does get it, who is willing to respond, who is willing to step out in faith, who is willing to say, God, Jesus, wherever you're leading them, as you move them, I'm going to go with you. If you're going to lead them out of this place into this place before you do the miracle, then I'm going to go with you from this place to that place. If you're going to speak it and it doesn't work the first time or they don't respond the first time, that's okay, God. I'm going to have grace just like you had grace. And I'm going to be there to celebrate the moment it happens and I'm going to walk with them because I'm going to see something and I know what I'm going to see is what they can't see just yet, but when we see it together, Jesus, you will receive all the glory, you will receive all the praise, and you will receive all the hallelujahs and celebrations that we have to offer. This is what happens when we see what they can. I want to pray for us.